the huge wholesaler, United Natural Foods Incorporated, employed a lobbyist who wrote a blog that was always focused on controlling any ethical concerns brought up by farmers or by the public. In a segment published in August 2016, the blog strongly objected to a lawsuit by the Center for Food Safety. The lawsuit was aimed at preventing contaminated organic matter and CAFO manure from being allowed in compost spread on organic farms. The blog demeaned the Center for Food Safety's lawsuit as being based on, quote, perfectionist objections by uninformed people who expect obsolete purity in their food. Welcome to the Real Organic Podcast. I'm Lindley Dixon, co-director of the Real Organic Project. We're a grassroots, farmer-led movement with an add-on organic food label to distinguish organic crops grown in healthy soils and organic livestock raised on well-managed pasture all without toxic chemicals. You just heard from Elliot Coleman, who was the lead off speaker in this past September on the main stage at our Churchtown conference called Real Organic, A World Movement. Elliot's contributions have strongly shaped organic farming practices here in the US. It's hard to meet an organic farmer who hasn't read his books or followed his practices. We are in sync with his new book about growing on-farm fertility and that the gold standard for organic farmers is to reduce off-farm inputs and to instead feed their soils organic matter. This resonates with many Real Organic Project vegetable farmers, much more than the idea that we should all stop tillage, a trend that has been popularized by chemical companies who are looking to sell herbicides in the no-till process. I also wanna thank Abby Rockefeller, who you'll hear at the very beginning of this episode. Not only does Abby generously donate her space and her staff at Churchtown Dairy for this conference. She also feeds us wonderful food while we're there and supplies the audiovisual team that captures these talks so that we can bring them to listeners like you. So thank you, Abby. We appreciate all of your deep support to protect organic farming. I'm going to give a harangue about words which is what I often do. And the key word is the word consumer. And I'm going to try to persuade you all to consider dropping it. (laughs) When you mean to speak respectfully of somebody, it is a term of disrespect. And so here's what it means. To the word to consume means to destroy utterly. In the old days, quite old, a couple of centuries at least ago, there were customers and there were merchants. When the merchants became capitalists, they renamed the customer consumer because they want us to destroy what we buy from them so we can buy it again. That is the system. So the word has that bad history. And there are many words to discuss. The other one is the word conventional. I don't believe we should allow the chemical ag, agriculture, no, the ag, chemical ag, they don't have culture either. They should not, we we should not agree to call them what they want to call themselves. Conventional sounds as if that's forever. That's who was here. They are new. Organic is the real word to represent what people have been doing forever. We're trying to get it back. And because it is good, because it is about the systems of life. So those, those are just two words that, are, that I, I'm going to harangue you about with today just to make you aware. When you're using the word consumer, do you mean to respect the people you're talking about or not? 
if you want to accuse them of being consumers, and if they are, if we are, which we often agree to be consumers, then okay, use it. But don't think of it as a term of respect. What's a good term? Oh, customer. Cu the old word. Customer, eater. Thank you. Eater, if it's about food. Customer, if it's about anything else. It's just, the, that's, that's right. Thank you, Chris. All right, that's it for today, for me. <laughs> Thank you, Abby. Um, all of this is possible through Abby's generosity and vision. And um, we have had conferences before, but this has got to be the best place. So uh, next up is Elliot Coleman. And I, just to tell a little personal story about Elliot, um, when I was very young, I... Uh, just had the good luck of getting to know Elliot, who happened to be living about half an hour from me. And he became truly a mentor for me. And I was just a young guy, didn't know much about farming. And uh, Elliot already knew a great deal. And we shared a certain love of books. So he shared his amazing library with me, as well as his experience and knowledge. In the, in the years that the organic movement has been growing in America, Elliot has been truly one of the um, leaders of that. And it's interesting because Elliot has never been certified organic, and um, not even with the Real Organic Project, which he says he would if he could, but he won't get USDA certified. And I respect that very much and the reasons that he has for that. Um, but I know that he has inspired thousands and thousands of young people to go into organic farming. And um, I hear about it all the time. So please welcome Elliot Coleman. That's great, thank you. I've been privileged over the time I've known Dave to watch him morph from this uh, crazy hippie who was farming with a team of oxen that he had trained into this unbelievable professional who has put together this organization. And I think uh, that is definitely praiseworthy. Uh, Dave asked me to open today probably because I was the most radical speaker. Um, and I want to say that my involvement with and support of the Real Organic Project has encouraged me to ask the logical question, what is real organic? Like most of us, I'm convinced that CAFOs and hydroponics obviously do not qualify as real organic. But what about the subtler invaders, the more nuanced changes from the early days of organic farming? So I made up a list of quite five questions that I needed to ask myself. First question, how was organic farming traditionally practiced by its pioneers? When organic growing began, pioneering farms created and maintained their fertile soil by actions taken within their farms, using processes which highlighted the importance of soil organic matter. They made soil nourishing compost from locally available pure organic wastes. They sowed green manures and cover crops and shallowly tilled them into the soil. They grew leguminous plants to add nitrogen. They devised uh, exceptionally uh, effective crop rotation systems for disease and weed control. They imported their own, incorporated, excuse me, their own livestock manure if they kept livestock. 
that was a very safe, self-contained production system. Nowadays, it is a very different world. Many of those traditional soil-improving processes have been replaced by products. In other words, by purchased fertilizers from off the farm. As I have always understood it, the original goal of organic was not to directly supply available plant food by purchasing fertilizers. That was the sole focus of chemical agriculture because it had no other option. The original organic goal was to create and maintain a biologically active fertile soil filled with homegrown organic matter plus a vigorous population of soil microorganisms, microarthropods, and earthworms able to recycle that organic matter into nutrients for another generation of plants. So I'm going to suggest this morning that commercial organic vegetable growers, and I am one, can enjoy exceptionally fertile growing conditions, a guaranteed clean, and that, by that I mean unpolluted soil, and far lower costs by growing that indispensable organic matter themselves. And by that I mean extensive use of green manures and cover crops grown on site as the inputs for soil fertility, instead of relying on purchased commercial organic soil fertility stimulant products from outside their property. Most of us in the U.S. were first exposed to organic by Rodale's Organic Gardening magazine, with all its advertisements for organic fertilizers. That put the focus on purchased inputs, which explains the attention in the U.S. paid to OMRI, O-M-R-I, the Organic Materials Review Institute. However, if I am not importing materials from outside my farm, I obviously have no need for long lists of which specific inputs are allowable. Organic farming would be greatly benefited by supplementing OMRI with an organization I will call OTRI, O-T-R-I, the Organic Techniques Review Institute. That organization would publish data re-emphasizing the importance of green manures, crop rotations, cover crops, growing legumes, and incorporating organic matter with shallow non-inversion tillage. The second question is, what problems are created by purchased fertility? My greatest concern in today's world is about the quality of the composts available for purchase. Compost has always had a reputation for goodness among organic growers. Um, <coughs> what about the unavoidable, residual environmental contamination of the materials from which the numerous municipal waste and confined livestock composts marketed today are made. Contaminants such as antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, herbicides, heavy metals, etc. The manufacturers of commercial composts are paid to dispose of waste products, not to create clean composts. The look of the finished product doesn't give any idea what was disposed of to make it. One of the principal motivations for Four Season Farms' preference for organic soil care has been providing our customers with food free from the incidental chemical pollution and the industrial toxins that pervade our world. Since the only sure way to assure a clean as well as a fertile soil 
is to grow our own organic matter right on the farm. That is what we do. The aim of our self-fed farm project is to consciously separate our farm's practices from the industrially influenced inadequate organic shortcuts that have become so common. Third question, what laid, led to this changed thinking? The organic movement was created over a hundred years ago by ethical farmers who instinctively understood the crucial relation between soil quality and food quality. Unfortunately, the influence of those ethical farmers was quickly marginalized after the organic label became big business and the marketers and the merchandisers pushed in and took over. That was the beginning of the end. The merchandisers did not have the same ethics. Here is one glaring example. The huge wholesaler, United Natural Foods Incorporated, employed a lobbyist who wrote a blog that was always focused on controlling any ethical concerns brought up by farmers or by the public. In a segment published in August 2016, the blog strongly objected to a lawsuit by the Center for Food Safety. The lawsuit was aimed at preventing contaminated organic matter and CAFO manure from being allowed in compost spread on organic farms. The blog demeaned the Center for Food Safety's lawsuit as being based on, quote, perfectionist objections by uninformed people who expect obsolete purity in their food. Second quote, synthetic materials should be allowed because the very world we live in is contaminated. How perfect can compost be in a polluted world? Now, let me be blunt here. <laughs> no real organic farmer I have ever known would have written those lines. The blog continually tried to intimidate any farmers attempting to defend old-time organic standards by accusing all criticizers of participating in a circular firing squad, their pop phrase. In other words, since the merchandisers now controlled organic, and since maximizing the amount of product for sale had become far more important than how it was produced, if you said anything at all, you were harming organic sales. Fourth question, what defines the soul of organic? All the classic old European organic farming books, after explaining their objections to chemical fertilizers, were mainly focused on improving the efficiency of the traditional farm-generated soil fertility enhancement processes. They wanted farmers to be independent. I want my farm to be so empowered and so self-reliant that it continue, can continue feeding my neighbors in perpetuity, no matter what economic forces may affect the stability of the world around it. If my farm can successfully grow bounteous, clean food harvests year after year without purchasing soil fertility inputs from outside, which is what we do, then I alone, not the ag industry, am master of its destiny. My farm's production cannot be interrupted, constrained, or limited by outside market manipulations, supply shortages, price increases, or delivery difficulties. I treasure that secure independence. Fifth and final question. Can farming that creates exceptionally clean and nutritious food and doesn't harm the environment also be adequately productive and economically successful? Of course it can be. Year-round green manures 
are every bit as good a source of vital soil organic matter as composted manure. Green manures also cost less, use less energy than transporting compost and manures over long distances, and are guaranteed pure because they are produced right on the farm. Green manures can be sold, sown with very simple equipment. They can be grown at times of the year when the soil is not growing crops. They protect the soil against leaching of nutrients. They provide important roots in the ground soil cover. They include a wide variety of plant families, so they can fit into almost any crop rotation scheme. They are scale neutral, effective for large farms as well as small farms. And best of all, they continue growing and protecting the soil while I sleep. And the organic matter and the nutrients that they make available are right there in the soil where I want them. So the answer is yes. We can return organic farming to its ethical roots. We can have productive and, and economically successful market gardens. And we can again guarantee clean produce to our customers. We just need to refocus on the well-tested, old-time, soil fertility maintenance processes that supported organic farming from the start. Thank you all very much. Thank you for listening to The Real Organic Podcast. Our movement is growing because you're subscribing and sharing these podcasts with your friends. So keep it up and leave us a rating and a review as well so that others can find us. You can find a video version of this interview on our newly designed website, realorganicproject.org, or on our YouTube channel. And you can join us every Thursday for a new episode featuring voices from the organic movement. See you next time.